Hi, this is Tim and Joel. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Iowa-Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Keosauqua, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. That makes sense. All right, so trying to get back to our sequence here. So we've laid down our fertilizer, right? Now what? Now what, what do I do? You're going to work it in. I'm going to work it in. Tiller, disc, field cultivator. You know, a lot of guys buy the equipment. Some guys work really good with the local farmers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they'll come over if they're in the area and, you know, they can usually make short work of a food plot. Usually it takes them longer to get to it yeah. than it does to work it. And some farmers want nothing to do with it. Other farmers are, you know, happy to work with you and get it and get it taken care of. It just depends on the, you know, and a lot of guys have spots that are, you know, way back in the middle of nowhere and we're not getting, we're not getting even small farm equipment back there. Right. Oftentimes those are some of our best plots. Okay. So I get, I want to get that fertilizer worked in though. It's not absolutely necessary to get it worked in, but it's just going to break down and become plant available so much faster if we stir it with the soil. Sure. All right. So I've got my stir, my fertilizer all worked in. Yep. And now what? Seed bed. You've worked it, you've worked the fertilizer in, you know, if, 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 depending on what we're planting, you know, if you're not, you know, if we're back to that Ladino chicory, for, you know, we need that that's firm what, seed bed. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Then probably something like a, 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 another disc pass or maybe a field cultivator or maybe a light tiller to get it, to get it, to get those clods broke up and get it leveled up and smooth. Keep in mind, if you're going to plant alfalfa, chicory, Ladino, you're probably going to be mowing this thing a couple times of the year, so we want it smooth. Not only for you riding around on the tractor and the brush cutter, but also a smooth seed bed is going to give us better germination. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, get that fertilizer worked in and then get that seed bed. It may be one additional tillage pass. It may be two additional tillage passes. But let's get it worked up. Let's get, it, let's get a good seed bed, and let's get it firmed up a little bit. I should have probably done that on my winter rye. A little more, but I was just really running against Winter rye is a bigger seed. It's not nearly as particular, and mm -hmm. it can go in quite a bit deeper. Winter rye is much more forgiving. Okay. But it's going to be a bumpy mow job. It could be, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. You got some it, ruts out there. It is yeah. what it is. It is yeah. what it and is. And this is another thing back on that topic. We really, whether you're a farmer or a food plotter, working ground when it's wet is bad. You're promoting compaction. You know, you could potentially create ruts where water is going to sit. You know, we're, we're, we're hard on the soil biology. We do not want to work ground when it's wet. That's where you get a lot of your hard clumps, mm -hmm. you know, clods yeah, from working wet dirt. We want to avoid, I'd rather see guys wait another week and plant their stuff a little later than recommended as opposed to trying to mud it in just to get it in on time. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, try and stay off plots when they're wet. I've that's got it. a five acres. It's uh, it's low, lower ground. Mm -hmm. It's it. it I don't want to say it's uh, I don't want to say it's um, like a bottom land, but it it's close to bottom land, and it will hold water. Yeah. Uh, so I know it's been worked, compacted yeah. and stuff. It's plots just, that it, hold water. You know, you know. Back to I was telling guys, you know, I never put a food plot where it can be easily seen from the road or on highly erodible ground where it can t t cut ditches. Another spot, you know, if you've got, if you want to put like a Ladino in a river bottom or a creek bottom, well, if, when you get big heavy rains in the spring and that turns into a, a river across there, that may not be a spot you want to put a food plot. Well, I'm trying to, this five acres that we're talking about, I'm trying to, it's really, I want to, I want to shore up the ground, 
and then uh, I don't want to really plant it every year. Okay. Um, but I want to have some, I want to add some tonnage, you know, to where, hey, it's a good grazing area. And I think you and I have talked. I mean, it mm-hmm. sounds like it's a candidate for Ladino. Sounds like it. Yeah. Right now I've got winter rye in it. But Yep. And rye's pretty forgiving and will tolerate a fair amount of water. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah, but but what you got to remember with rye, if left unchecked by the <laughs> middle of May, yeah. it's going to be to the top of your head, <laughs> and you'll have a lot of biomass to deal with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like we tell guys, every food plot guy is has got his own thing going on. Every scenario is unique. So that's why we like to sit down and talk to guys. Guys think I ask a lot of questions, and I do. I am noted for asking a lot of questions. But the more information I have to process, the, the more the more I can lead you the right direction. Yeah. So, so it sounds like, I mean, again, on this rye field that we just talked about, it sounds like I'll be frost seeding in some ladino. Mm-hmm. And that's a great place to do it. Okay. Yep. You'll just have to mow that rye because it's going to come on really, really strong. But it almost acts as a nurse crop for your ladino as it's, deve- as it's growing. That can work really, really well. I know we digressed, and that's kind of my role. I'm the master digressor, so we're going to get on. <laughs> but I mean, let's 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 kind of go back to where we we've got our seed bed, you know, fertilized and smooth, and yep. now we're ready to plant the seed. Yep. Right. Okay. So you're a you're a drill. I mean, I, I highly I, recommend drilling if yeah, you can. Yeah, I own a great plain six foot drill, and it, you know, I've it, it, there was a lot of learning curve to it, but I feel like for the most part, I've got it down now. I'm I'm, I'm past the big mistakes. Um, and if you've got a drill, that's great, but you don't have to have a drill. You can absolutely, I mean, you see that behind you, that, 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 uh, hand spreader. I mean, we sell several of those every year. They're great for alfalfa, ladino, brassicas. Um, a lot of plots get walked in this way. What I tell guys is knowing your plot size is critical. We have a lot of guys come in and guess their plot size. I want to know how big that plot is accurately because unless I know how big it is, I have no way of giving you the right amount of seed. Now, fortunately, with some of the species like Ladino, Chicory, um, Alfalfa, if we get it a little heavy, no problem. But like, as you guys know from Brassicas, we get Brassicas too heavy, problem. Yeah. So what I tell guys to do, let's say you come in and say you've got an acre of Ladino. We're going to do straight Ladino. I give you 12 pounds. I would like to see you put six pounds in the cedar and walk one direction, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then come and get the other six pounds and walk the other direction, just like we do when we do Ladino or uh, Brassicas. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't care how many times. As long as I know the plot size, we'll know how much seed to give you accurately. And then you just have to, whether you're pulling it on with an ATV and a spreader or whether you're walking on with a hand cedar, I don't care how many times you got to go over that thing, but get rid of the seed that I gave you and then come back and roll it. And all we want to do when we roll it, you just want to, you want to imagine a good firm seed bed. Are you talking now like you've... a cult packer? Yep, exactly. Yep. Yep. Some guys will even use a lawn roller. Yeah. Either way. All we want to do, here's what I tell guys. You don't necessarily need to bury that seed. We just need to embed it. Think about a flower pot. You know, you put some soil in it and then you just kind of firm it up with your hand and we sprinkle some seeds on there, just push them down into the soil. The natural settling of the ground and any rain you get in the next few days is going to take that seed on down in, and when it gets warm enough, it's going to sprout and take off. Okay. It's just that simple. All right. Embed the seed. Don't necessarily think about burying it. Just let's let's embed it down into the soil. Now, have you? Uh, is it okay to plant on top of snow? Spread spread seed on top of snow. Let's say we're at four inches of snow. Would you do something like that? I, no? I personally wouldn't, okay. especially on erodible ground, because I think if you get rapid snow melt, you know we've we've seen instances where all of a sudden you'll get a warm snap come up and it'll jump up into the 60s or even mid 60s or even occasionally low 70s. The last part of you know or maybe the middle of March you'll get a freak warm snap and that snow will just be melting so fast it could be carrying some of your seed with it. Like a river runs through it. Almost. At least in spots in that plot. It may not do it. And then you may find a whole lot of Ladino down at the bottom of the plot the next spring and you're light up on top. It didn't move all the seed, but it moved quite Enough. a bit of it. Yep. Right. See where I'm going with that? Sure. Where we like to do like the frost seeding, and that's almost a whole nother episode in itself. We like to see most of that snow gone before you frost seed your Ladino clover. And then if you get a light snow on top of it, it actually kind of melts it into the ground. Perfect. 
Hmm. So to answer your question, no, I don't like to frost seed on a lot of snow. If it's perfectly flat, you can get away with a lot more than you can if it's on a erodible okay. type piece of ground. That's good. Yeah. yeah good All right. So we've prepared our soil. Now we go out and we're gonna, we're ready to plant, mm -hmm. right? And yep. now you recommend a drill, but we we can broadcast, broadcast it. it. Yep. I mean, we can do a number It'll of things. Fine. Then we cult pack it or roll it. Yep. Then what? Then what do we do? So at that point, once you roll it and you've embedded that seed down into the top quarter inch of soil, your job is pretty well done till it till it's up and growing. Right for rain. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, a lot of guys have good moisture there when they when they seed it. Sometimes it's a little dry. Um, that's when you really want a half inch of rain. I mean, that's that. Or you get a, a three quarter inch that takes all night to come along. Perfect. And that's inevitably when you get the three inches of rain. <laughs> I always tell guys if you can kind of watch the weather in advance, you know, it helps, but you can't control it. Sure. So, yeah, that's when you want that rain. You know, once that seed has enough ground temperature and adequate moisture, it's going to sprout and off, you know, off it comes. And alfalfa, ladino, they're all fairly cold tolerant. So you should be, you should be pretty good shape at that point. Okay. So yeah. then, then you get into weed control or, yes. or management. Yep. What's that? And typically, what's... like with Ladino clover, the number one problem we have is grass coming up in the Ladino. Alfalfa, oftentimes the same thing. A lot of times it's foxtail. Um, we talked about this a minute during the break briefly. Clethodum is typically the herbicide of our choice to kill grass. It's, it's, a, it's something we use at about 16 ounces per acre once a year. Wow. It's a good grass killer. It's not really super fast, but it's very effective. And spraying's a whole nother episode in itself. But um, usually grass is our biggest enemy. Really with Ladino Clover, we have found that if we get plenty of seed on the ground and we get good germination, good fertility, generally after the first year, we may spray for grasses once and maybe spray for broadleaves once, maybe not. Generally, we can control most of the weeds with mowing. What, uh, I know cleft works on grass, right? What would be a, a herbicide for broadleaves? There's a couple new ones out. We just took on at the, towards the middle of last year. I have not used, 2,4-DB will work in some situations. This goes back to knowing the grass or knowing the weed in your plot. Yeah. Because we were talking during a quick break there where you stepped out. We had a guy a few years ago come in with, he was, he, was ex, he was explaining this grass he had in his Ladino clover. It was in a pretty wet area. And he said, this grass just keeps coming back. And he was trying to explain to me what it looked like. But a picture is worth a thousand words. Sure. It turned out he was spraying with clethodim and it wouldn't touch it. Well, when he brought it, finally had enough, he grabbed a handful. And he was a little, you know, he's 35, 40 miles away. He brought a handful of it into me one day in a Ziploc bag and it wasn't grass. It was yellow nuts edge. It was a sedge. Clethodim's not gonna touch it. So we wasted a lot of time and energy on trying to kill a sedge. He's spraying with a grass herbicide. So when you're, whenever you get into, you know, we can talk about spraying for hours. Sure. But the important thing is knowing what weed or what grass you're trying to kill. Because herbicides are not cheap. And we don't want to poison, you know, we don't want to poison your, your, the environment by, by spraying more than we have to. Right. That's right. You know, it's time, it's money. Let's be smart about it. So I'm Let's here, I'm, my takeaway from that, Aaron, is, is clethodin's probably a good maintenance herbicide to is. keep the grass down. It is. Then if you start seeing broad leaves, maybe pull mo some and, or mo. and check with your... Yeah. If you've got a broadleaf weed coming in there, you know, or even if you're close to a co-op, you know, a lot of the guys that spray corn and soybean fields, they know what that weed is in, in a second just by looking at it. It may be more appropriate for you to go to your co-op and say, hey, Aaron, these guys said it's mare's tail or ragweed or you know, yellow water fox hemp. tail, water hemp. So <laughs> bad when we fight down here. Yeah, mare's tail and water hemp or water hemp probably being the worst of the two. Um, but usually mowing. The, the thing I tell guys, though, if we don't get a good stand of our desired food plot seeds, then we may be a candidate to start over, just tear it up and start over. If we have a lot of grass or we have a lot of broad leaves in a really good food plot, that's one thing. But if we've got a lot of grass and broad leaves in a really poor food plot, you're probably better off instead of spending a bunch of money trying to salvage it, let's just start over. 
And something else I'm going to throw out here for a lot of guys, we get this we get this quite a bit where guys are going to put a food plot in a uh, an old pasture or an old hay field, or they're going to put it in an old CRP field where there's been years and years and years of grasses and weeds going to seed and no history of weed control, no history of fertility, no history of lime to get the pH where we need it. We may want to think about doing like a Liberty Link or a GT27 or an Enlist or a Dicamba soybean there for a year or two to get some, we get our fertility build up a little bit, we get our weeds under control, and then put your perennial Ladino or your chicory or your alfalfa so out burn, there. Burn yes, yes, yes. Then... Go go to an annual for a year or two and then come up with a perennial. Makes a lot of sense. It yeah. does. Yeah. Let's try and clean it up a little bit. That may not be something you hear from every food plot guy, but I, I like doing that, especially areas where we have a history of weed problems. So let's go back. You, we, we planted our chicory, clover, ladino clover, and alfalfa, alfalfa Our mix. three-way mix. Yep. We, we planted that. Yep. And we've put herbicide on to control it. Let's, let's take a step back and let's say things go bad, right? And again, we're specifically talking about this mix. So we, okay. we, we planted it in the spring, and in the midsummer we find out, boom. Failure. Failure. Okay. I'm a... Deer season's coming. I'm panic. I'm in panic mode. I have no food. I have no food. All right. Now what? Okay. So let's say you you would have a couple options. That particular mix could be fall seeded as well. So you may just choose to wait till mid August and try it again. That would be one option. Will that give me enough tonnage? You think? It's not going to give you much tonnage in the fall. So I'm not doing that. So what you may want to do? This is where I said Plan B is oftentimes. Yep good to have, you may want to say, okay, your Ladino clover plant in the fall isn't going to get very tall because the days are getting shorter. That plant knows it needs to root down to build up reserves so it can survive the winter and overwinter. Right. So it'll blow up in the spring, but it's you're not going to get a tremendous, and plus the days are getting shorter, so you're getting less sunlight than you would have had when you planted it in the spring. Sure. So you're not going to get as much growth on it. Our days are getting shorter. The days are getting cooler. All those things are working against you making tonnage. So you may want to say, okay, it didn't work out like I wanted. Let's go back to purple top turnips or radishes or, or like our kitchen sink mix, which is a 10-way blend of brassicas. You may want to go back to plan B. Okay. Yeah. And so then B, the nice thing about that is the deer are going to wipe out 95% of your brassicas, they decompose very quickly over the winter. So you would have the option of going in there probably very, very early in April and going back to that three-way mix we talked about. Could I plant both at the same time, brassicas and my three-way mix? <sighs> Sorry. You're, you're Sorry. asking a lot. Is it impossible? No. But you would be, I mean, with a 10-way with a, with a brassica mix out there plus another three species, the perennials, it's possible, but it would not be my top choice. And we could talk about that later, but I don't think I would attempt to go. You're really shooting for a, a home run there. Okay. Big time home run. All right. Mm -hmm. I don't think that'd be my first choice. Okay. I just don't. Nope. A little, I, have, I have some questions around this three-way mix as far as just kind of uh, seasonal maintenance on it, right? So I spray my cloth. Um, you know, it's it's coming up, but I'm getting some weeds, broad leaves here or there. Talk to me about mowing. When should I mow? When should I not mow? How much should I mow? Okay. So depending that mix, we, we sell that mix to a lot of guys that that uh, they can't get they can't really tell me exactly what their plot looks like. It may be in Memphis, Missouri, maybe Albia, maybe Mount Pleasant, maybe west of Atumwa. It's they can't explain every single plot to me. So when we, we do a mix like this, we know the, the, the species that's going to survive the best in that mix is going to be whatever the, that particular site is most suited for. Okay. If it tends to be high and dry, and it's a drier year when we plant it, your alfalfa and chicory are probably going to be the dominant species. If that plot tends to be down a creek bottom where it's a little wetter, your ladino is mother nature is going to pick the species that's most suited for that area okay. and that's what's going to thrive there that makes sense so that being said as far as maintenance on that let's just assume everything does relatively well i would want to mow that 
And like my Lodino plots, you know, they'll get up about, you know, foot, foot and a half tall, and then they'll go into white blooms. Yeah. That is usually when I mow it. That's when it's going into its, its uh, reproductive state. And that's when I, I tell guys, I don't mow my food plots. I clip them. I never, ever more knock off more than 15 or 20% of that plant. And there's two reasons I do that. Number one, the deer are going to be more attracted to it when it's when it stays in its vegetative stage as opposed to reproductive. That's going to be more tender and palatable before it goes into reproductive because the plant's actually becoming sexually mature when it puts seed pots on. It's becoming mature. It's more tender when it's growing up, if that makes sense. Sure does. So what I tell guys, when my clover blows up into white blooms, that's when I clip it. And I'll usually cut the blooms off and maybe two inches of the plant. I never want to cut more than 20% of that plant off ever. Number one, if you do that, you're going to throw a lot of trash. You could potentially smother with the, with the, with the, with the like, they're like lawn clippings in, in a way. And you don't want to smother it with that. And I tell guys, if it's hot and dry, leave it alone. Don't stress those plants when it's hot and dry, especially on poor soil. Because they're already struggling enough. Let's not put them under a... Because when you clip those plants, it's sending a signal to that plant to regrow. Because you got to remember that plant at all costs, Mother Nature is telling it to grow up and make a seed and have babies. Sure. Hmm. That's what Mother Nature is telling that, that plant to do is reproduce. Day, right there. Mm -hmm. For me, anyway. Don't... You know, I guess... I guess for a lot of us, it's like growing a crop of corn or soybeans. The more we can limit the stress, the better. Because when plants are under stress, they're not as productive. They go into more of a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not dormant, and that's not the word I'm looking for, but they go into kind of a, I'm going to protect myself type stage. You know, when it's hot and miserably dry, those plants are using, you know, they're not growing much. They're using every ounce of moisture they can gather from the dew in the morning or whatever the root system can get a hold of to survive. So we don't want to go out there and clip it when it's a hundred degrees and there's cracks in the ground an inch wide and stress that plant even more than it's already stressed. Because really plants and people are no different. If that plant is highly stressed, when things pick up when the temperatures cool off and it starts to rain, they'll recover. But the better condition those plants are in going into that stressful period, the faster they'll recover when it starts to rain and cool off. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So do you have any other questions? Because I've got a, I've got a few. I've got some, but they're unrelated to this three-way mix. So. So are mine. Okay. Yep. And guys, I just want to let everybody out. You know, I'm picking alfalfa, ladino, chicory. That's kind of a general mix we put together. There's a thousand other options sure. we could possibly do, but um, that's a good mix to start with, especially if you're a novice and just starting. And we're just using that for an example Absolutely. to talk through, right? I yep. mean, I mean, other food plot experts will be listening to this and going, "Oh, there's a hundred other things we could have done there." Yep. I wonder why he picked those. Those are just three good well, ones to I start. Well, I think your blend. point of you know every food plot's unique and every soil situation is unique and that's why we ask so many questions yes yeah, it's, yeah it's, it, you, there you can't take a cookie cutter approach, you're right, right so there's no one size fits all so let's let's shift gears then so the question i've got is is okay the three-way blend um we got that we covered that what would be like a plan b then if i said hey i've for whatever reason that i tried the three-way blend it didn't work or i want i've tried this and you know i'd like to try something different just to compare over four or five years what would be your now you're talking about like and tim was talking earlier if that plant if that plot failed yeah or, or you, you or talk or about just hey, different I've, scenarios here hey I've, I've had great you know i've had mod, mediocre success with this three uh three seed mix um and i've done it for three years but i think i try, something, try something else just something new just to okay. learn okay not saying i wouldn't go back to that but sure. what would be you, you know, want a printer or an annual B? Um, what would be your plan B? So there again, you know, if, if I'm trying to, if, if I'm a, we have a lot of guys that don't bow hunt and they just hunt like shotgun and muzzleloader. So we're not going to recommend alfalfa, ladino or chicory to them. We're going to look something more like sorghum, brassicas, winter wheat, winter rye, triticale, winter peas, something along that line. Something that's going to, that's going to handle the cold weather. When I put food plots together for cold weather, I want stuff that's going to stay as green. I want as much dark green tonnage I can have as possible. So 
brassicas might be, the thing about brassicas, they're dirt cheap. They really are. Even our blends are relatively inexpensive. A lot of guys will do straight purple top turnips. We do a mix that's got purple top turnips. Uh, I think it's a, it's a forage rape and a tillage radish. Very, very inexpensive mix. Very, very productive mix. Very easy to grow mix. You don't have to worry much about weeds in the fall. This is another thing back to your three-way mix. Weed pressure in the fall is way, way, way less than it is in the spring. Usually when we're doing these fall plots like triticale, which is a hybrid cross between wheat and rye, winter wheat or cereal rye, usually weeds are not a problem in the fall. When we're planting food plots in August or early September, usually weed is not an issue for the food plot guy. Usually not. We Now, if we're doing that three-way mix, we may have to worry about weeds the next spring, of course, sure. but we're probably not going to have to worry about it in the fall. So you would have, you know, if, if you're going to do a, if you wanted to do something new in the spring, your options are wide open. And, and, and I'm not opposed to corn and soybeans. A lot of our guys are still very traditional on corn and soybeans in their food plots, and they've worked for years. I think we can get a little more creative than corn and soybeans, but they've been a standby for us for a long time and they work, our deer are accustomed to those. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever not recommend corn and soybeans. I just think there's other things we, we can do to add some variety back to that diversity. Sure. You caught my attention with sorghum. Can we talk a little bit more about sure, sorghum? Sure, go for it. So is sorghum a fall? Would I plant that in the fall or is that something I would plant in the spring? Sorghum you'd plant in the spring. Okay. Sorghum's a little more unique. A few minutes ago, we, you know, I told Tim about you know that that three-way mix we were talking about earlier that could go in first of April, absolutely. Sorghum would be a little bit different. Sorghum is more of a summer annual, so we want to see soil temperatures at least 60 degrees and rising before we plant sorghum. Sorghum does not like wet feet and it doesn't like cold feet. Sorghum likes heat. It likes adequate amounts of, of rainfall, but it it does not like to have it's seed planting cold soil. And it's a good deer attractor. I like it. We sell sorghum, grain sorghum. We sell grain sorghum to a lot of guys that can't get corn to grow. Sorghum will grow on poorer ground than corn and be more productive. It will tolerate more drought than corn will. The thing about sorghum though, it, it, it is not attractive early to deer. We have found sorghum is mostly attractive very, very late. Shotgun seasons, muzzleloader. I believe it has a lot of tannin acid in it that makes it a little bitter. The longer it sits out in the field, I think the more that tannin disappears. And our experience, deer cherish grain sorghum. Hmm. We plant, I planted a half acre last year. I was mm -hmm. thinking it was for dove, right? Yep, yep. And, Probably uh, not your best dove plot. No, well, it, it certainly was, <laughs> wasn't. Right. Uh, but I would tell you that uh, it was annihilated. I mean, in two weeks, the deer. It, was, it was gone. Yeah. Every head was... Nickel. There is another benefit to this. We've got a farm I, I work with intensively up in Jefferson County up by Fairfield, and it's loaded. I mean loaded with pheasants. And the reason we like the sorghum, the, 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 it, it benefits both. If you have quail and pheasants, it not only does it provide a great food source for the pheasants of quail when the seed heads break over and fall, you know, fall down towards the ground, sure. it's very accessible for the pheasants and quail. The deer will leave very, very, very little... To clean up they'll get they'll get most of it um but it also provides a lot of thermal cover and hiding for birds sure so i really like sorghum because we have a lot of guys that that are that are north of here that have a decent quail especially pheasant population but they're trying to kill deer as well but if you wanted a food plot that you wanted to kill deer in early in the year sorghum would not be my first choice okay but absolutely is an option, especially on lighter ground with lower fertility, sorghum can be a good option. Be a good screening too. Um, if you're looking for a screen screen, we sell a product called Egyptian wheat. And yeah. it'll get, you know, <laughs> eight to thirteen feet tall, depending on, you know, when you plant it, the fertility and how much water it gets. But it makes a wonderful screen, much, much, much taller than grain sorghum. Okay. Most of your grain sorghum are gonna be in that forty eight to fifty two inches tall. Sorghum's gonna be or excuse me, uh, Egyptian wheat, much, much taller. Yeah. There again, it's an annual. You're going to have to plant and it every year. it's a very warm weather. It is. Uh, the soil needs to be it warm. Is. We've I, had guys down here. from experience <laughs> yeah. here on that one. We've had guys actually plant grain sorghum on, on uh, July 4th weekend and had it actually do a very respectable crop. Wow. That's a little, we would like to see that planter ideally first week, second week of June. Okay. So it's a little unique there. 
Okay. But sorghum, I think, is a very good option, especially for guys that can't get corn to grow. Deer don't seem to slaughter it early. You know, once a deer pull the whorl or the center out of a corn plant or chew it off early, it's done. Sorghum, they don't seem to be attracted to it as nearly as much when it's in its infant stages. Interesting. Yeah, when yeah. it's in vegetative. Okay. So, so how about uh, dialing back with regards to, you mentioned, hey, whoever listeners, other other food supply suppliers, how do I choose a supplier? I mean, what are the, some things I should be thinking about as a buyer? A lot of guys buy their food plot stuff from their local co-op. And I'm not knocking the co-ops because we deal with those guys all the time and some of them do a really, really good job. Um, I think they're great for you know some of your chemicals and your fertility. Um, however, Sometimes seeds not their number one thing. Most of the co a lot a lot of the co-ops do focus on corn, soybeans, and some small ag seed, but very few of the co-ops are focused on food plot seed. I'm not saying they don't carry some radish or some turnip around for cover crops. Sure, little work, but you're asking as far as what. Repeat the question a little bit. You're looking so for so yeah, someone like Tim and Joel. We're looking to do a food plot. What are some of the yeah. criteria I should be looking at to know that this is a reputable supplier? Yeah. First of all, somebody that's been in business for a while. Yeah. That's, you know, not say a first year. I had to be a one year seed dealer at some point in my career. Sure. We all have to start somewhere. But I would say try and buy from somebody that's been in the business at least like a couple years. Um, seed quality is everything. We don't really see a lot of poor quality seed out here anymore to be I, brutally honest how do i know it's high quality seed so you can get on youtube you can do a lot of homework on the internet about reading a seed tag uh -huh. i i make sure virtually nothing goes out of here that has any age on it we want new seed a lot of time if i've got seed around here it's got a little bit of age on it we'll either discard it throw it away or we'll sell it at a huge discount or i will use it myself Sure. But it won't go out to the customer. So the seed tag, I guess the things I would tell you to look for is you want a current germ test. You want to make sure that seed's been tested in the last six months to make sure germ's good on it. And you want to look at the, the weed seed in the, in the tag. And you don't want to see a lot of weed seed in it. You want to see a very, very, very low, low percentage of weed seed in the tag. And a lot of people can get online and, and educate themselves a lot about that. Okay. Reputable dealer, quality seed, um, two of the big things. Okay. So I think we covered it off of, hey, what's better, annual or perennial? I think it just kind of depends. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The guys that have a lot of acres, or I shouldn't even say a lot of acres, but some of the guys that have a fair amount of acres, sometimes a rule of thumb we'll use is 75% perennial and 25% annual. So that, what would be a lot of acres, like 10? Um, if you've got 10 acres of food plots, you've got a pretty, a lot depends on how many farms you're doing this on. If you've got 10 acres of food plot on one farm, I'm guessing that's a pretty fair sized farm. Um, a lot of guys, you know, have three, four, five different farms. They, they rotate around. They might have, you know, an acre and a half on this farm, two acres over here, four acres over here. But yeah, I would say, what we would see normally, uh, the average size guy is probably one to three acres. I would say mid-sized guys, three to 10, and anything above 10, you're getting into pretty good food plot acres sure. for the average guy. Well, that's a big investment, too. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. talking about now, if you're an outfitter, it might not be unusual that you've got 40, 50, 60 acres of food plots on several farms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Aaron, what's the most creative kind of food mix that you've seen and, and have someone be successful with it? We had a guy from Michigan come down here a few years ago, and he actually brought his own seed. And this was back when I was doing some food plot work for some guys. And he had, there were like 17 different species in this mix. And I couldn't even identify a third of them. They were stuff out of northern Michigan and some of the stuff out of, I mean, and I knew, and he had stuff in this bag that was gigantic seed size and stuff that was like dust. And we drilled it for him and how do I want to say disaster in a nice way? It just, <laughs> just didn't, didn't work. work well. He wanted it drilled. So, you know, we were kind of finding the happy medium. Some of that bigger seed we knew was supposed to go in, you know, an inch, inch and a half. Other of that seed was quarter of an inch max. So we were trying to find a happy medium for that. Um, we didn't really know what to do for fertility because there was legumes in it. There were some grasses in it. There were some grains in it. I'm, 
I'm I'm all about diversity in these mixes, but I think you can go too far with it. Um, we do, you know, like I said, we do we do a couple. You know, our kitchen sink has ten different brassicas and radishes blended together, and then we've got a, an experimental mix where it's got you know peas, um, a, a, a couple pounds of our kitchen sink brassica mix, and some clovers, some manual clovers in it. So it's as creative as you want to be. But the one for Michigan there back in 08 or 09, that was just... And it didn't work. It was well. a failure. Yeah. Yeah. It was tough to spray because there was so many different species in it. Um, some of that stuff the deer had never seen down here. It was a northern Michigan type thing. All right. This very is my odd, total last odd. question here is, is what, you know, food plot seeds, if you've been in hunting long enough and doing food plots, or you see things pop up every once in a while, trends. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. What's, what's kind of the, the new age kind of thing that you're seeing over the, this year, or last year? Kind of really thing? the last couple of years, I really haven't seen anything shockingly new. Yeah. There was Ethiopian cabbage a few years ago. I've never um, heard Ethiopian that. cabbage. I saw that to make sense. And I'm not saying it's not good. I just, whenever something new is brought to me, I want to research it. Um, Sun hemp's been another one. That's been a cover crop mix traditionally. It's a it's a heat loving annual. Um, deer do have some attraction to it. I've planted it in some cover crop mixes, and the deer have you know it's kind of funny. They would nibble on this one and maybe nibble on this one and maybe the next six or eight they didn't touch. It was kind of like something at the salad bar you'd never had on your plate and you wanted to try a little bit of it but really didn't care for it. They probably weren't acclimated to it. The first year I planted brassicas north of Fairfield, they rotted in the ground. Those deer were corn, soybean creatures. That's what they'd been brought up on. I mean, I don't even think half of them had seen an acorn because there's not an oak tree within five miles of that farm. And they were acclimated to corn, soybeans, you know, whatever natural browse they had out there. There was a few alfalfa fields. Um, but, it, you know, by the time we got into January, they were chewing on a few of the radishes. They were chewing on a few of the turnips. The second year I planted them, they wiped it clean. Hmm. So, you know, and, 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 you know, here again, it goes back to everybody's situations different. Some guys plant, they don't have food for miles. Some guys, they've got food plots everywhere, you know. I got to ask. There's what, so many variables. E Ethiopian cabbage. They call it Ethiopian cabbage. Is We've it, never sold it. Is it? Like how big a, what's that? Plant? I honestly don't know without going back and looking it up. I researched it two years ago and I haven't revisited it since. Yeah, write that one down. It wasn't right. something I saw as a as a single component. It was done in a blend. I believe it was in a brassica blend we saw that. And so like I said, I'm not saying good or bad about it. It's just something we hmm. haven't. So let's talk about some of your proprietary blends. Okay. Um, we're just kind of wrapping this up. And I, I you have a couple of proprietary brand, blends that you do. I think we're fans. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about them? So our kitchen sink mix is probably our number one seller. As a matter of fact, I just sent some of that to Michigan a couple days ago. Um, another guy had come down from Michigan, bought some for five acres. He killed a 170 class deer, I believe. Um, I think he plants. I think he actually planted some of that here on his Stockport farm, killed a 170 class deer, and I think he took some back to Michigan. So his buddy was down and bought some more of it here just less than a week ago. It's a blend of, we use two different types of radish. It's got two different types of uh, turnips. It's got two or three different types of above ground brassicas. And that's been, a, we, we did that I believe three years ago for the first time and sales on it get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And I believe it's under $30 an acre. Yeah, I tell you what, I put in uh, yeah. two acres of it uh, one year. Not last year, but um, yeah, it was last year. Yeah, and it, it grew to the size of my knee, <laughs> and um, and I think it was important. You you coached me on hey, you got to have fertilizer in there. Yes, uh, it's not like buying Casey's gas. We want to put in the high octane gas yeah. for a race car. Yes, uh, so we can get the tonnage. Something like that's what you said. Yes, and uh, I mean when you walked through it, it was like walking through yeah. a salad. Yeah, we've got pictures of it. Guys have brought pictures of us, and this was a drought year for us because we didn't have a we didn't have a measurable rainfall from I believe it was the twenty third of July till the sixth of September. We went, and that's that's the worst part of the year not to get rain. And we had guys plant the kitchen sink mix, and some of it was six inches, eight inches above their knee, 
And that particular guy is 6'1", 6'2". So we have found that the, the, here again, the diverse mixes, they just cover more territory. They just give us, they just give us, they give us more chances of success under adverse conditions versus single species. But the kitchen sink one's been a highly, highly popular one for us. Um, we've got one in the experimental stage right now. It's a mix of uh, winter peas, crimson clover, bursine clover, balanza clover, and our kitchen sink mix in a blend. Mm -hmm. um, wanted to get that in a little earlier this year. And then, of course, we didn't get any rain whatsoever. So we had to, we're just going to have to back that off a year and start again with it next year. Um, for the pheasant and quail guys, we have a, what we call an early successional mix that's a sorghum, sunflower, millet, Egyptian wheat, grain sorghum blend that gets really, really tall and just provides incredible amounts of thermal cover. That's been very popular with our quail people, or excuse me, our pheasant people, but we've also seen the deer use it like a super highway. We believe they're going in it just bedding down. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I've got pictures of that on the computer. It's a it's a jungle mix. And that's an annual it. mix. Though, that's right? an annual mix. That's one's going to be planted every year. Yep. Okay. Yep. We well, use that. We use that mix in rotation with some other mixes. Okay. Mm -hmm. The the kitchen sink definitely become comes Midwest hunting and outdoors by two dumbass proof. Right. It's, <laughs> yeah, uh, we've used it yeah. for a couple years now, and um, yep. it's amazing. Yeah. Stuff. We also do our own Ladino clover blend. We sell a lot of Ladino clover, and we're not you know we're not reinventing the wheel here, and we're not pretending like we are. Um, we have just found four really good Ladino clovers on the market. We've used them in a blend at different percentages. And, and, you know, it's something we sell in that $6 a pound range. Mm -hmm. And it's been wildly successful for us. We go through hundreds of pounds of that every year. All right. Uh, so do you have any other questions? No, sir. Yeah. And we have a lot of guys who just come to us with their own blends and just say, hey, Aaron, would you look this over? What do you think? I want to know if it's good, bad, in between. What are the pluses and minuses? And we're happy to do it. This business we're in is all about customer service. Absolutely. It's all well, about customer service. It, great, that's great that's all it is. Highly recommend it. Yep. Highly recommend it. Yep. Yeah, good really job. appreciate this. This has been super good. I mean, we could, like I said, we could talk here. Yeah. We Kinda just tell like, guys, call us. We The one thing we do ask for a lot of our guys, though, in the food plot world, though, if you can get those questions to us, you know, in March and April before things get really wild busy here, it, it's appreciated just because we can, if we can sit down and have this conversation in January, February, or March, mm -hmm. we can be so much better prepared. Well, this podcast will be airing in March, I'm okay. guessing, okay. and uh, we'll definitely include your uh, contact information in this. So, uh, you know, listeners, if you got questions for Aaron, yeah, you know, there's not a dumb question in this business. Nothing, thank you. Nothing so much. is a dumb yeah. question. Really Nothing. appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. No problem, guys. Thanks thank for having you. me. And yeah. uh, as we always say, be, be safe, safe yes. have fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors. <laughs>